The following interview was conducted with Nelson Parkhurst for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Feb Monday, February the 4th, 2008 at his residence in West Lafayette. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the oral history librarian. Welcome. Tell us a little bit about where you were born in your early years, your parents. I was born uh, in Johnson County, that's southwest, east, southwest of Franklin, Indiana, which is the county seat of Johnson. And uh, my parents, I was born actually on what is now the state road that runs north of Camp Batterbury in a log house. And we moved from that farm to about three other farms and we lived in just north of Trafalgar uh, on what we call the Three Notch Road, which was a, now it's a state highway leading from Indianapolis to Morgantown. Uh, and we, I, I was uh, in high school there we were about three quarters of a mile from Trafalgar, and I walked to school and uh, graduated from Trafalgar High School in 1934, and uh, came to per or 1932. Was out of school for two years. Uh, didn't think I could go to college because I didn't have any money, but I got a 4-H scholarship. Uh, came to Purdue with a very little bit of money and some a, a scholarship, but uh, I had to work all the time I was at Purdue. Uh, Tell I, us what you did at Purdue. Where did you work? I, I worked, uh, well, I lived with Dr. Larry and Mrs. Larry, which is across from the old Jeff High School in the east side, and I walked across, and then I worked in... Uh, cafeteria in the Union Building for Geneva Nugent, who was then head of the food services. And uh, they got, uh, the, I was there with her for four years. Then uh, when, when I, did you graduate from Purdue? I graduated in 1938, uh, I guess. And uh, then uh, I taught vocational ag. I graduated in ag education. Taught vocational ag at Morristown in Shelby County for three years. Then I came back to Purdue and uh, started work on my master's. And I worked for Geneva Nugent again while I was there for a while, and then I uh, taught school down at Jackson Township for one year. Uh, incidentally, on the way somewhere along there in 1939, while I was at Morristown, I was married to Annie Laurie White, who is now deceased. But uh, we got, uh, and after I left, uh, See, I. Well, Did you have to go into service? I had to go into service, but a year before I went into service, I went from uh, where I was down to Jackson Township and taught school down there for another year. Uh -huh. Then I was drafted, and I went from Indianapolis. Well, I was drafted actually from Shelby County because I w registered when I was at. Uh, Morristown. Then I was uh, went with uh, five, four other fellows. I was uh, given orders to take the, the, see that they got to Kearns, Utah, and so we took a train from uh, Fort Harrison to Indianapolis, and then from Indianapolis to Chicago, and then from Chicago to Kearns, Utah. And uh, I was in basic training there. When basic was over, well, it was this, these five fellows that I was with for East, and I was in the 
hospital for a little while with a, an infection, throat infection. So uh, the fellows I was with to start with went west after they finished basic, and I was then thrown with uh, some fellows from California and Washington and Oregon. And when they, when we got through basic, we went to Chanute Field, Illinois. So I was get pretty close to home. I uh, hitchhiked home on my first day off and got the car. And then every week I would uh, drive back home when my, on my day off. Back, and home was then to Franklin where uh, my wife Annie Laurie lived with her parents. Then uh, when uh, I finished, we were over at Chanute. We took training in celestial navigation. <coughs> we taught uh, navigators to fly by the stars. <coughs> this was a building with a dome on it and fixed lights. And it was air conditioned and everything so that the lights didn't change. And uh, <coughs> they. Uh, uh, they could also. There was also a terrain mechanism. Most of the time, we had no pilot in the plane, just the navigator. <coughs> the the uh, navigator would be. Uh, he had to go up a stairway on the side, and the navigator would when the plane had, or the fuselage of the plane was way up off of the ground, and it had to be on the true east heading before they could get in. And of course, they couldn't get out unless it was on a true east heading. Um, we uh, lost two navigators in those trainers. Uh, one in the trainer that I worked in after we left there, and I was down in Chatham Field in Georgia. <coughs> There was another one in a trainer in the state of Washington who they, these fellows finished their training and instead of calling down and waiting until the time was up and the lights were back on, uh, they walked out. And it, it was a four foot thick concrete floor, so they never knew what hurt them. Uh, I left. Uh, when I finished at Chanute, uh, I had uh, a, de a delay en route to, uh, i forgotten where I went. I went to New York. And uh, there I got, uh, I had a hernia operation. At, uh, and while I was, after I finished there, I went to a, boys training up in uh, New Hampshire, I think it was, and I was there for about a month. And then when I left there, I went down to Chatham Field, and that's out of Savannah, Georgia. And I was there until I retired. From uh, the military? From, well, I wasn't out of the military right then. I. They had, we ran out of uh, this training business, and I was transferred over to a, what they call a training aids section. And I built uh, training aids. Uh, one of them was a, radio, a thing to tune in a radio, and it was a big board about four feet by two, and uh, had dials on it, and when you turn one dial while another one would turn somewhere else that was hooked together in the back. And uh, then uh, they wanted somebody to uh, talk about uh, the GI Bill. So I read the GI Bill and boned up on it and I went over and I was lecturing to the people who are getting discharged. <coughs> and uh, 
<coughs> right on that. Uh, one day, the fellow who was in charge of that said, uh, <coughs> why, don't, <coughs> why don't you apply for a discharge? Well, he told me who to see. There were two other people, and he said, <coughs> go down and see the whack, Captain, but don't go to the other fellow, because he doesn't like the idea of people getting discharged just because they're educated. <laughs> and uh, so I did this, and so I... Kind of watch the microphone, keep so you hear it. Okay, go ahead. I had... Uh, uh, took I took my application down, and I had to have um, I don't know two or three addresses on it, and, and I had to have I saw I had two letters that I attached to it that showed that I could show how many vacancies there were <coughs> in the state of Indiana for vocational ag teachers. And uh, <coughs> I took that <coughs> letter and that <coughs> I don't know why I have that cough. Mm -hmm. Another letter from a, a uh, somewhere else and I can't remember where that second letter was from. But I put attached these to my an application to, for a discharge and turned them into the headquarters to the first sergeant. And uh, the sergeant, or the major over in where I was lecturing to <coughs> the discharges <coughs> didn't think I put an application in. He kept asking me and I told him that I put it in. And so he called the first sergeant and said, <coughs> Sergeant, you have an application for a discharge, and I want it, and I want it today. And so he got this, and uh, the next week I was discharged, and uh, I had to go from Chatham Field to uh, down <coughs> to Florida. I don't know just why, to get discharged. And then I got discharged and drove back to Indiana. <coughs> and that was in late December. Uh, of 19... Uh, can't think of what year that was. In late December, anyway, uh, and uh, then uh, I uh, went to uh, up, came up to Purdue, and uh, applied for a job in the admissions office. Uh, and I thought I'd use the GI Bill. I fin I'd finished my master's when I went into service. I thought, well, I'll use the GI Bill and maybe I can finish a doctorate. But I uh, had to wait until the 6th of January to get in, get the, my contract signed with the admissions office because President Ovdi was coming to Purdue. And he came on the 6th of January in 19, <coughs> excuse me, 46. And uh, I got a call shortly after 8 o'clock that I want to know why I wasn't at work. And I said, I don't have a contract. And he says, well, you do now. And so uh, by noon on the 6th of January of 46, I was up here. And I was in the, the assistant director of admissions in 46 to 40, uh, eight, 47. 
47, I was, <coughs> Clarence Damon was registrar. And 47, I became the assistant registrar. <coughs> and that was, uh, uh, well, I was there in uh, that assistantship as assistant registrar from 47 to 1948, or 1957, mm -hmm. and Clarence died in 57, and then I became a registrar and secretary of the faculty. Mm -hmm. And incidentally, in those days, they gave us uh, titles of professor or assistant professor, and I was assistant professor as a assistant registrar, and then I was had the title of professor when I was registrar and secretary of the faculty. Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, where do we go from here? Um, you were the ones, the, and uh, tell them about the enrollment trends. You were involved quite a bit in that. I mean, that's your forte. Yes. The predictions uh, um, those uh, for all the Indiana universities. I did that. Uh, we, uh, I uh, had to estimate the enrollment for Purdue, and so while I was doing this, other people wanted theirs done, and so I estimated the en enrollment trends for all of the colleges and universities in the state. And uh, I did, they did, uh, I did pretty well at that. <coughs> uh, uh, what, why were, uh, what brought, what led to predicting enrollments? Did they know approximately how many people were going to be coming? What, they didn't have any uh, estimate as to how many applicants? How many were going to be, what the enrollment was going to be at Purdue? Uh -huh. How many were going to be in each school? How many is going to be in each class in each school? That is for That's a big, fresh, big prediction to work on. It's a big prediction to work on, but it seemed to be an essential prediction. And, uh, it, uh, I, I did a fair job of doing that, and then uh, <coughs> for Purdue, and then other schools wanted me to do it for them. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I worked with, after, <coughs> while I was still doing that, uh, I worked with Betty Sudarth, and uh, she uh, took put all of these methods, she had put on the computer uh, the various methods of, she had three different procedures for estimating enrollment, and she, and we estimated the enrollment with those three predictions for each of the schools in the state. And I remember that one of the schools, <coughs> the president of this was a college up north, uh, wrote and one of her predictions was exactly what their enrollment was for the year. So she was right uh, on target. Pleased about that. Right, yes. Did you do it for all the schools in Indiana or yeah. just the state schools? Did you all do it for of the, them. all of them? All, all colleges and universities. You did the, the enrollment predictions? <coughs> yes, and Betty did too. Uh huh. And that, was this for the Indiana Conference of Higher Education? I guess it's the Indiana Commission. Was that what no, you were? It wasn't with? for them. It was oh. just for the schools. Okay. Now, I was invited to attend the conference, which is the presidents and <coughs> deans of all the schools met together. <coughs> and I was with them for some time. Two or three times. Uh -huh. uh, <clears throat> I uh, I can't think where we go from there. 
Um, the um, you've been tell us a little bit about what secretary of the faculty. What did what did that involve? And tell us a little bit about, <coughs> more what you did in the registrar's office. What I did in the registrar's office. Mm -hmm. Okay, we well, in the registrar's office, first of all, the, the uh, registration was then held in the armory, and uh, the students came in, and there was a big walkway across, clear across the armory, crosswise. And up there on the board where they had all of the, showed all of the sections that were open and all of the courses. And we had uh, Jim Blakesley and he uh, was a tall fellow and he could walk that and keep that uh, in order. <coughs> yeah. <coughs> so that lasted for some time and then we eventually went from there to uh, a Quonset hut which was uh, sort of east and north of the executive building and uh, we had uh, some boards there and Jim kept those in order and the students came down from that street that leads back out to the stadium and <coughs> lined up there to get in order to registrar. I remember one time I walked <coughs> down and asked the students what they were there and one of the fellows said, well I saw this line and I thought I ought to get in it. And he wasn't, he didn't need to be in it at all. <laughs> but that, you, <coughs> with your cough, do you want to continue or do you want to reschedule? Are you okay? Oh, I think I just want to go ahead. Okay. Um, w the registrar changed over time, didn't it? Um, what were some of the other things that you... The registration process changed. Did it during your oh, time? Yeah, yes. Well, uh, we, f we got... Uh, when we got into the computers, the... Uh, we had <coughs> the process of registration changed drastically and uh, <coughs> went from the process of using cards, which they had done before, to using a computer. <coughs> and the computer uh, did the job without uh, the students being in a line somewhere. They simply went to their professor and uh, they called in, just told the computer what they wanted and they got it. Um, and that's about where we were when when I, I left there. Mm -hmm. And of course we had uh, all of the records on the uh, computer and we could update the records and uh, before we had people sitting around making transcripts we had three people that did nothing but make transcripts all year round and it took sometimes two or three months to get a transcript after you uh, left the sem the sat after the semester was over. But when we got everything in the computer, <coughs> we put the request for transcripts in there and they stored them. And the day after the grades were in, all of those transcripts were printed out, ready to be mailed. Uh, there several other things maybe that went on that I don't think of right now. Uh, maybe Betty will think of some of these. Mm -hmm. I should interview her. Uh, Purdue was the first university to use computer-based scheduling of classes, wasn't it? I think that's right. right. And then also you were involved, wasn't the registrar's office involved in the commencement exercises? Oh yes, at all times. Uh -huh. uh, 
Did you set the dates? Who had set the dates for the commencement? Well, that was... Uh, would the president's office set those, or...? No, well, it was just the calendar, the annual oh, the calendar. calendar. Okay. <coughs> and uh, we had very interesting experiences with uh, registration. Uh, the uh, Lee Club was on one side of the stage, and the band was on the other. Then they had a long wrist chairs across, and the deans and all of the honorary ex uh, candidates were on the stage. We had the diplomas in little carts that we pulled up there and uh, had two people, one on each side, uh, that gave out the diplomas for the undergraduates and the graduates. Uh, I handed those to the president, and he presented them to the graduates. Um, but before that all took place, we they gave the honoraries their degrees, and uh, I had always had a little table behind my chair on the stage, and I sat right by the president, and I'd uh, give them the give the president, when the dean presented the honorary, then the president would say something, and I would give the dean the diploma and the hood that he was going to wear, whatever that was. But uh, we had some interesting things happen. Uh, I remember one time the uh, master's degrees, uh, for some reason, in our little cart didn't come out right. So I asked the president to present him with a diploma and tell him to exchange later. And he did that. And lo and behold, when the commencement was over, they had passed these diplomas around, and each one of them had their own diploma, which was rather interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, the commencement schedule was different then, was it not, because of the calendar? You just had, did you have a spring, was it spring only? Oh, no. Oh, had, did you have a winter? We had, had one in the spring and oh. then one in the winter. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, one time, uh, I recall we had the uh, honorers up, and for some reason, on that little table that I had those uh, hoods and the diplomas on, I had the wrong ones. I had the ones for the afternoon exercise. So I, Jim Blakes, or wasn't Blakesley, it was. Uh, Somebody else, I can't think of his name right now, saw what my problem was, and he, the boys were sitting on each end of the stage. And so he took off and went over to the building and brought all of those diplomas back. So we gave each one of them a, a diploma but, and a hood, but it was, it was the wrong one, so they, when they came back, or when it was over, why well, we gave them the right one, and nobody noticed that, <laughs> which was rather yeah. interesting. You <laughs> had a lot of contact with the students, didn't you? You said change it was it was a chance to meet with them. Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, a student came, would come in ever so often, and I remember when uh, one of the fellows that's here now. Clyde Smith came in, and that was, I was, uh, I guess, assistant registrar at that time, but uh, he was going to enroll, and he had had some experiences, and I said, I think you can get some credit for the experiences you had if you get together some material, and he did that. And he's always appreciated it. And he's living here now, and he's a 
still flakes of out. What a small world. Yes. Yeah, right. Uh, there are several other things that happened, you know. Uh, I became uh, somewhere along the line, I became the president of the National Association of Registrars and Admissions Officers. And I remember that when we got back, I was at a luncheon over in uh, one of the faculty lounges, and uh, President Hovde came around and stuck his hand down in front of me, and he says, I want to congratulate you, and says, and I want you to know that this is an honor for not only you, but for the university, which is a rather interesting thing. Well, go back to, as I said, I went to work with First Day President Hovde was on the campus. You were the first but, person that uh, he signed a contract for, I understand. Right. And uh, then uh, all along, he would come down and see me once in a while. He came in and wanted to know if I could find out what chance uh, somebody from the state of Indiana had of getting into a school of veterinary science. And there were 18 <coughs> schools at that time. So I sent a letter <coughs> to all 18 of those schools, and uh, I got a response from all 18. And uh, I wrote up a little report and gave it to President Hovde. Then he presented this <coughs> to the state legislature, and they, as a result, they created the School of Veterinary Science and Medicine. Very nice. Um, well, you worked pretty closely with Dr. Hovde. You got to know him pretty well. Very well. Mm -hmm. and he would come down and see me and talk to me frequently. Because uh -huh. you were in the same building. What's, yes. The same Hub Deep, which is now known as Hub Deep Hall. <clears throat> he was right up above where I I was mm -hmm. on the first floor, uh -huh. main floor, and he was on the second. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, what else? Do uh, we... What about the secretary of the faculty? <coughs> Can you tell us what some of those duties, what did that involve? Well, that was an interesting thing, too, because when I <coughs> first got that job, That's I uh, was asking people come and call and ask for something. And I didn't have any records. I didn't have anything. So I got a hold of a lady who had been around for a long time, and I can't think of her name right now. And I told her that she had just six years to finish her tenure with the university. And uh, what we could have her do was more important than most anything else. So she went around to all of the schools, and talked to the secretaries and got <coughs> records and pulled these together. The records of the schools? <coughs> the records of the faculty meetings. <coughs> Then I, when she retired, I think it was Dor Doris Kimmer, got her to do that, but we bound all of these reports, and from that time on, uh, the reports were bound uh, for each school. Mm -hmm. uh, did you go to the faculty meetings uh, as well, the, yes. the university senate, yes. which is now known as the senate? I was uh, secretary of the faculty, so I sat right beside the president. Mm -hmm. And you took the minutes? Well, I always had somebody else taking minutes, but I knew what was going on. Uh -huh. Okay. And then you kept track of the records and things of that sort, yes. the procedure manual? Yes. Right. Okay. <clears throat> What was the big change, do you think, in all the times that you were in the registrar's office? Maybe the uh, aid of the computer was probably the biggest change, do you think? Well, I suppose. We went from a paper cl thing or clumsy method of 
hand doing things to a computer and uh, the computer was much faster and of course <coughs> by the time I retired they had all of the information on computers <coughs> students could go right to their advisor they didn't go anywhere else mm -hmm. got their schedule it was what else do you have um you were the parliamentarian also for the secretary of the we the parliamentarian for the senate as well as the secretary to the faculty were you that or just primarily the secretary you keep track of the uh for the minutes and things of that sort well, I don't know what uh, parliamentarian Keep would. track of, you know, Robert's Rules of Order, if there's any question, you know, for the uh, vote and things of that sort. I don't think I don't think we ever worried about that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then your professional associations, and you do get, and you got that Distinguished Service Award from the American Association of Collegiate Registrars and Admissions Officers, which is nice. Yeah. And the also from the Indiana Association of Collegiate Registrars and Admissions, you got those awards. Yes, and I got, uh, well, when, when I retired, I got, I was made uh, second floor of the Wabash. Did that come as a surprise? Well, as, yes, a little bit. <coughs> was it at a special, was it at a special dinner, or how did you find out about it? Well, it was at a dinner for my retirement dinner. Okay. In the union. And I got uh, that uh, special thing from the president besides, and uh, I don't know what all. It was um, quite what, a. What, tell us about the retire. What did you have to retire at sixty five? Was that? Uh, I retired at at. Uh, see how. I guess I was sixty five. Uh, okay. I didn't have to, I had to retire. I didn't have to, I guess. Okay. By that time. Uh huh. And what have you been, do what, tell us a little bit about what you've been doing in your retirement, your activities. Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I, con busy? I continued for two years. After you retired? Down on uh, one of the committees that met down in Indianapolis. And I did not know that the governor wanted to change uh, one of these committees. And uh, so he wanted somebody else to take the place I had. So he made me the secretary of Sagamore of the Wabash again. And uh, so I left that. That's you got two of them. I got two of them. I, but I, re I took that. Uh, I was out of that committee then. I have been on any committee since. Uh huh. Uh huh. Did you do it? Uh, how is the campus? Do you think the, the campus has changed since you've been there? Oh, it's changed dramatically. The but enrollment has increased. The enrollment has increased. And when you came back after the war, the enrollment was they had a lot of the people from the war that came. The servicemen came on campus like you did after the, after World War II was over. Right, mm -hmm. uh -huh. yeah, and you had to estimate what, uh, how many uh, were going to come each time, and so each year we estimated. And finally, we just <coughs> I think they decreased for about three years, <coughs> and then they started to increase. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh, what's your favorite memory of Purdue? Do you have a favorite memory? Or an outstanding event in your life you'd like to share? Huh. Well, uh, I think, I, I, I guess maybe my favorite memory might be that the working with some of the people that I had to work with. Uh, primarily people like Betty Sue Darth and uh, President Hovde. Uh, you think of an out, outstanding event in your life? Something that comes to mind? An outstanding event? Mm -hmm. Well, 
1949, I got married. <laughs> That's very good. That's outstanding. Are there any questions that uh, you'd like to ask that we're not asked? Any gen any general comments? Well, I don't know what. Comes I, to mind. I, I suppose there's several things that I might talk about, but I don't know what they are right now. Well, anything special? Something about uh, well, school? Well, the, the interesting thing is, uh -huh. I told you that <coughs> the president of the uh, I went to work the first day he was on the campus, and when our younger son graduated, he uh, was in the glee club. And they, we gave the glee club their diplomas first in the morning and the band second. The afternoon we gave the bands theirs first and the glee club second. And uh, Bruce said to me, he said, you know, I may get the last diploma that President Avde gives. And I says, your name doesn't begin with Z. And she, he says, well, I know. Well, sure enough, that's the way it worked out. <coughs> so when President Avde, I said this was the last diploma that I gave him, Bruce's diploma. And he opened it and looked at it for a second, and he said, well, this really, this is coincidental, but he said, "This when I my first responsibility as president of Purdue was to present this young man's father with his contract." He says, and this will be the last diploma I will give to a student as president of the university. Small world. The small world. Tell us about your family. Did your children go to Purdue? Yeah, you mentioned yeah, this one. Both. Uh, Roger was the older of the two. <coughs> and he graduated from chem engineering. And went from here to uh, Washington and uh, graduated in uh, law. Uh, patent attorney and has been a patent attorney for ever since he graduated. Mm -hmm. Is he practicing in Washington, D.C.? He practices in Washington. Mm -hmm. he, uh, he lives in Alexandria, Virginia. He has four boys and uh, the younger boy, Bruce. Your other son? Yeah, he's uh, about four or five years younger than Roger, and he graduated in, well, actually, physical education. And then he came back and got a master's in uh, school or education, or not in, yeah, I guess in education and uh, school management. But he was for several years sold for Owens Carling fiberglass. And then he now, well, he left, left Owens Corning after about 11 years, I think. Then he went with Wilson Learning Corporation and uh, lectured to uh, people who were employees of corporations. And they, he lectured on a sale, <coughs> about sales. And then he decided he didn't have to be with Wilson Learning, so he was on his own, and has been ever since. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and he tr he makes contracts now with corporations to uh, lecture to their employees, and travels all over the United States and abroad. That is, he'd been places like Brazil, and he's been in some places in Europe, and uh, he's on the go all the time. Yeah, uh, very, very. He's. It's hard for him to get here. Where does he live? He lives in Toledo, Ohio. Mm -hmm. He has three children and, <coughs> and one grandchild. Mm -hmm. There's a grandson. Uh -huh. 
Good. And he has a daughter who works in Denver, Colorado, <coughs> and the mother of the grandson is a CPA, and she's over in Columbus, Ohio. <coughs> His son uh, graduated from Purdue, and he's now with Owen Scarning Fiberglass, and he was a salesman for quite a while, but he's back in Toledo at their headquarters now. Mm -hmm. Well, good. Uh, and that's as far as I go. Okay. Any, any closing remark, anything special you'd like to say? Well, it's been a great experience. Yes. You're a native Hoosier. <laughs> a native Hoosier. Right. Yeah. And a Boilermaker, right? A Boilermaker. There you go. As a, uh, in the, I was an independent student until Bruce was initiated to Phi Gamma Delta. And Roger had been a Phi Gamma. So they called <coughs> who wanted to, me to be a Phi Gamma. Well, I was, <coughs> I went down to the to Feigam house and Roger was there. And uh, they put me in with, right beside a Bruce when they brought him in to be initiated. <coughs> so I became a Feigam. Very good. Do you, do you keep in touch with them? Well, not very much. I, I I don't see well. I don't get around. I don't walk as well as I used to. Mm -hmm. And I, <coughs> I don't drive, of course. Sure. Okay. That's it, I think. Okay. Thank you very much. This concludes the interview.